So my um, no disclosure is relevant to this talk. And um, okay, so my uh, my job here is to talk about pulmonary embolism, and uh, of course this is a different um, venous intervention world itself. I'm going to start with a quick case over here. This is done a few years ago when we actually started a PERT program. We're trying to still understand how uh, PERT and uh, how to risk stratify patients when they come with acute massive submassive PE. So this is a 91 year old female who presented with symptomatic shortness of breath. Uh, she actually recently uh, was sent home after a pelvic fracture and she was in rehab. In rehab she had UTI and of course she was uh, mostly immobile. And uh, while she came to the ER, she was hypotensive and she was given fluids and her blood pressure became better. Her heart rate was slightly high, she was tachycardic, sinus, she was tachypnic uh, and required 10 liters of oxygen to maintain saturations over 90%. Uh, she underwent a CT angiogram that shows a bilateral pulmonary embolism and RV was enlarged, the ratio was more than one and her troponin was positive. So these are kind of patients we see, do see routinely in our PERT consults, and the question is what's next? So of course, as with any patients, uh, you have multiple options. One simple option would be to undergo any coagulation treatment that most of the patients do undergo as their only treatment modality, uh, which should be given to all the patients with PE. The second option would be either local intervention with thrombolysis or mechanical embolectomy devices or systemic IV thrombolysis. So let's tease through this as to how to walk through this journey about how to risk stratify these patients. The first question is who needs intervention? So on the right side of the screen are the low risk patients whose blood pressure is normal, whose RV is normal, their troponin may or may not be positive, and they are the patients who require only anticoagulation. Some patients can be discharged from, from the ER directly. Some patients require bridge anticoagulation to PO before discharge. The next two categories are those patients with massive and submassive pulmonary embolism, and those with low blood pressure, whether they're stabilized or not. And now this in, uh, inclusion of syncope as a massive PE definition has kind of broadened the scope of whether we can intervene on these patients without giving risk of systemic thrombolysis. So we know that most of the patients uh, with pulmonary embolism do well. What are the patients that actually don't do well? So patients who present with either shock or hypotension, they have a very high mortality from 20% to as high as 65% depending on what studies you, what studies you read. On, on the second uh, band of the spectrum are those patients who have normal blood pressure but they have some kind of dysfunction right ventricle dysfunction with or without troponin elevation suggestive of myocardial injury or necrosis or myocardial strain, and their risk for mortality, whether in-house or upon discharge, is between 5 and 12%, depending on what studies you read. So these form about 5 to 20% of the patient that you would see in your practice uh, presenting, at, uh, presenting as pulmonary embolism. There are three main components of uh, assessing these patients, and the most important is right ventricle. So, all the studies, all the data that has been published or will be published in the future is based on right ventricle. So it's very important to understand as, as a PER team member or as a physician or as a clinician to be a right ventricle physiologist. So it has been shown that if your right ventricle ratio is more than 0.9 to LV ratio, you have about three times the mortality if the ratio was normal. However, this is not just a number. As the ratio goes higher, that means the risk of RV strain is higher, the mortality is higher. So in patients whose RV-LV ratio is more than 1.5, for example, they are in the highest spectrum of mortality irrespective of their blood pressure. So they may be normotensive, but they still have a high, blood, uh, they still have a, uh, high mortality. Hence, hence the importance of understanding pulmonary embolism not from just a clot viewpoint, but from a right ventricular viewpoint. What's the next thing you can do? So we have some data points, and there are some clinical data points which I think are extremely important in, in understanding the physiology of these patients. And one of them is the simplified pulmonary embolism severity index. So PESI has been used in the past. It's a little bit cumbersome, hard to remember. S-PESI or simplified PESI score is five hard point endpoints that include age, uh, uh, past medical history of cancer or heart failure or COPD, and three markers for tachycardia, hypotension, hypoxemia. And we assess these in all our patients. The, the beauty of this number is that if the SPESI score is zero, your mortality is the lowest risk. It's a clinical risk predictor. 
However, if your SPASI score is one or more, you have just changed the mortality from low risk one person digit to 10 times of 10%. So this helps really a good clinical screening tool for you to risk stratify your patients. So back to our case, in this patient who was nanogenarian, uh, she came with low blood pressure but stabilized. She was in the zone of massive versus submassive PE. Uh, her SPASI score was three, her RV was dilated, she had positive troponins, so we had elected her to undergo low dose thrombolysis infusion. She underwent 12 hours of 0.5 milligram of thrombolysis infusion bilaterally. And this is uh, the pre-treatment on the left side of the screen and post-treatment right on the screen. Same for the right pulmonary artery. You see the large clot burden completely disappear. And there is good pulmonary venous return, which I use in my angiograms as a marker for what is the success of your thrombolysis, because it is just not the removal of the large clot. It, in my opinion, it is the peripheral perfusion that actually helps improve the patient mortality. And a post-intervention uh, CT clearly shows that the most of the clot has gone away and the peripheral perfusion has improved, and the RV that was dilated pre has now gone to normal. Uh, there are multiple other modalities. I, uh, second is a large both thromboembolectomy. This is a 28 years old pregnant female who is a nurse in our uh, unit. She came with a massive PE on clot. Her blood pressure was 90. Uh, of course, she was 35 weeks pregnant, so we elected like to do large bore flow retrieval embolectomy. This is uh, six runs of embolectomy was done. As you can see, pre and post, there is significant improvement in the distal perfusion. The proximal clot may or may not be improved. And this is the pre. Uh, uh, intervention RV, which is severely dilated. Uh, McConnell sign is classic over here, and this is 48 hours after intervention. Her RV is close to normal. Uh, the, the third uh, device that is uh, probably going to be coming to market soon with FDA indication would be the Penumbra thrombus uh, uh, aspiration catheter. Extract P study has already been done. This is probably one of the largest study, about 150 patients. I am anxiously awaiting the study as results as well, whether this small bore embolectomy catheter would be a game changer. Just to understand, uh, large bore embolectomy with flow retriever, uh, nothing is still 100% safe. 2% patients still needed adjunctive thrombolytics. The mean procedure time was close to two hours in the cath lab. ICU stay was one and a half days, and half of the patient did not require ICU, so maybe they were not that sick enough. Um, their average RV LV ratio reduction was pretty uh, robust at 0.38, and uh, despite not using thrombolysis, there was about a 4% risk of major adverse events with one uh, requiring surgery as well because of major bleeding. Uh, this device was never studied for either massive PE or severely hypoxemic patients. It's important to remember all the patients were stable with normal blood pressure and FIO2 requirement less than six liters. The local thrombolytics data every uh, two to three years is looking more promising. Initially with Ultima, then with Seattle 2, and now with Optalyze. Low dose infusion has been now proven not to be just efficacious in terms of RV improvement, but also in terms of significantly lower bleeding rate, which is even lower than uh, or at least equivalent to the thromb thrombectomy arm, which is about 3%. Uh, how do we uh, risk stratify these patients? Just a couple of more slides. Uh, patient's hemodynamics, RV function, SPC, and biomarkers. And if the patient is either at high or intermediate risk of pulmonary embolism, you should consider percutaneous clot intervention if the clot is uh, intervenable. Again, very important, RV has to be enlarged, and you need to have positive troponins to give you that high intermediate risk stratification. To summarize, patients who are acute PE and who are not low-risk patients should be considered for percutaneous intervention if they are stable for procedure, if they meet the uh, criteria for SPC score of one or more, have RV strain, have positive biomarkers, and cloud is percutaneous accessible. It is extremely important to make sure that you, you have all other data in your background, including demographics, symptom onsets, what kind of symptoms, what are the labs, is the lactic acid high or not, is the patient DIC or not, because all these things will predict your success of intervention. Thank you very much.